I'm Jonathan Mayer. I'm uh, Sunil's chair uh, of this dissertation. I'm a professor here in uh, geography and also epidemiology and several other places as well. And I'd like to welcome everybody here, those of you from the university and uh, those of you who aren't in the university uh, as well. Welcome uh, both to the Department of Geography and to the uh, University of Washington. Um, today I'm honored to introduce to you uh, Sunil Agarwal. Uh, he's both a PhD student uh, in the Department of Geography and uh, he's a medical student in the School of Medicine here. Um, he'll be speaking today about his PhD research uh, and this is just prior to his returning to his third year of medical school. Um, we, as a committee, uh, as a PhD committee, have also decided uh, that this will serve uh, as the public portion uh, of his PhD defense, uh, even though uh, the defense itself will take place sometime in the next uh, few weeks to uh, uh, a month or so from now, um, because of some minor revisions that need to take place dissertation itself. So uh, with that, uh, I introduce to you uh, my colleague, friend, uh, and student, uh, Sunil. Come on, thank you all for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce my committee members just for a moment, if, if, I, if I will. Um, next to Jonathan is Professor Mark Sullivan from Psychiatry and Medical History and Ethics, who's the graduate student representative of the committee. Uh, we have Professor Richard Morrell, Dick Morrell, uh, Professor in Geography, who's serving on the committee. Professor Ethan Russo from Department of Pharmacology. And, um, where's Craig? There he is. Um, Craig, Professor Craig Zimbrennan, also from the Department of Geography. And um, there should be another committee member on the way to publicly come in, uh, Professor Gregory Carter from the Professor of Rehabilitation and Medicine. So I uh, thank you all for, for being here and, and thanks to the committee members for coming. Well, I'm just going to dive right into this. As uh, Professor Mary said, this is a presentation on my dissertation uh, about pro-dissertation research that was field research that was conducted um, over the last year in Washington State. Uh, the Medical Geography of Cannabinoid Botanicals in Washington State, Access, Delivery, and Distress. So what I mean by, first of all, medical geography is that this is a social science, medical social science field that looks at human environment relationships and tries to use those to explain and understand patterns of health and disease. And the field has traditionally looked at either disease ecology, how diseases are uh, spread out in the environment, and also looked at access to health resources. So this dissertation research is along the access lines uh, access and delivery lines of the tradition. When I say cannabinoid botanicals, that's a scientific way to talk about uh, marijuana or medical marijuana. But I've chosen to go with a scientific term because the term marijuana is loaded with historical baggage. It's a pejorative term from Mexican, Spanish, Portuguese slang. It doesn't really have any scientific meaning. So the, the way that the medical marijuana system or cannabinoid botanical system in Washington State, excuse me, and other places functions is through a geographically distinct uh, sort of system where, where patients access treatment at one facility at one site and they are delivered treatment at a completely distinct site. And this is a function, a result of the way that the conflicting legal nature of the system is uh, has sort of forced it to be. So on the one hand you have access, which uh, is where patients can, under medical supervision, uh, receive what I call marijuana medical amnesty, meaning pro amnesty from state level prosecution under uh, marijuana laws. They're also able to receive medical information and treatment monitoring from a Washington licensed doctor. Then uh, at another site they are able to receive deli delivery of what I call germplasm, which is scientific term for plant genetic resources that are available in the environment. 
Um, so that germplasm is maturated and delivered to qualifying patients at, at other locations. And then the third aspect of the system is, is patients who are involved in this care coping with the sort of mixed legal status that they have, uh, which I'll go into more in the talk, and that's why I talk about distress and structural violence. The symbols here I've represented for this is the symbol of the International Cannabinoid Research Society for the access, the picture, a drawing of a cannabis uh, seed for delivery, and the Amnesty International symbol, which the Amnesty folks were very happy for me to use uh, for this talk. So the dissertation research covered three different areas. These are the titles of the papers, and I'm just throwing them up here to show you that this is all how I'm going to organize my talk, briefly talk about each of these different areas. Characteristics of patients with chronic pain accessing treatment at a rural clinic. Subjective health status of qualifying patients delivered a full lot of maturated germplasm. And given the contraband biotic consumption and the political ecology of mental distress at facing possession charges. So another as aspect of access, we're going to go into the first paper, is, is having a, a degree of acceptability. Because medical professionals operate in the United States and all over the world now under certain specific guild organizations, national, state level medical societies, specialty groups. Um, so it's important to, under, to know that when you look at the access to, to physician authorization to medical marijuana, that a number of organizations, in national, international, and state level of specialty, have, have recognized the need for legal access to marijuana for specific medical purposes, including the Institute of Medicine. Recently, you know, this medical student section of the American Medical Association and the American Medical Student Association, the American College of Physicians, which is the second largest physicians group in the United States, and a whole host of other physicians groups, including the HIV Medicine Association and the Infectious Diseases Society of America. So this gives a certain type of uh, legitimacy that, which allows physicians operating in, in states to exercise their medical judgment. So why they've been so quick to do this, and so why there's this whole host of organizations as there weren't maybe 15, 20 years ago, has to do with the science that's evolved around cannabinoid botanicals, which is based on the science of the endocannabinoid system. So in 1988, and then in, later in 1990, a, a cannabinoid receptor was cloned in the, in the human, actually in an animal model, but it's been discovered to be one of the most widespread receptors in the human body itself. Uh, and the chemicals, some of the chemicals in cannabis actually bind to this receptor. And before, before 1990, we had no idea how they worked. And now that we understand that the can cannabinoid receptors are high, highly expressed in a variety of tissues, brain, muscle, liver, GI tract, pancreas, and there's another receptor called the CB2 receptor, which is expressed in immune cells. We, Start, a picture started to form that validated the folk medical traditions of cannabis and put it into a context of modern receptor-based pharmacology. Um, and just to also mention that there's two key endogenously produced chemicals in the human body. Others are as well, but these are the two most well-studied ones. These are similar in shape three-dimensionally to the chemicals that occur in cannabis. And um, those are called endogenous cannabinoids. This system has been around for in biology for 600 million years. But like I said, we've just recently discovered it. The reason why it's so, it's so old is because it plays a pretty integral role in cell-to-cell -cell communication, intracellular communication. And it's normally silent, but in disease states it can um, become pathologized. This is a picture of a CB1 protein structure diagram of the CB1 receptor itself. Um, it's, it's a member of the Rhodopsin family of receptors. G proteins for those for those of you who knows what that means, but it really just tells tells you that, that there's seven transmembrane loops that thread across the um, membrane of the cell, and uh, like I said, this is one of the most highly expressed uh, <coughs> receptors in the brain. Interestingly enough, we also discovered, um, and just as a quick aside, that cannabinoids go backwards; they're retrograde neurotransmitters. We hadn't ever discovered this sort of system of signaling in the body before. Mostly. We've seen presynaptic to postsynaptic cell signaling, but now cannabinoids go backwards, and that tells you that they can play a role in modulation or feedback, homeostasis. And so that's why it has such an important role to play in these particular physiological processes, including pain perception, motor function, mood, 
learning and memory, immunity, inflammation, feeding behavior, etc. And so it just so happens that the cannabinoid, uh, cannabinoids in cannabis module, uh, work with this system, but they only appeared on Earth 37 million years ago. So this is much older than the cannabis plant. Research in cannabinoids and cannabis has exploded in the last uh, last two decades, I guess you could say. Since the cloning of the CB1 receptor, there's been an explosion. Over here in 64 was when we first discovered the chemical structure of tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. And there was a concomitant increase in research. So you can see here that um, this has sort of helped to validate the, uh, the, the science. And um, th this is basic science research, I should specify. This is about the pharmacology, the lab, uh, biomedical, basic biomedical facts, basic science. Not so much in the human, human side of things. Because of, that, because of that science, we actually have cannabinoid medicines in the American pharmacopoeia again today. 